we know is going to be a very hard one to crack. It seems to have been a professional killing, a cold-blooded execution almost. Now, you may not know who did it, but you might, might know of a motive or have a clue. The victim was Lloyd Simpson, a Londoner, and if you're an East Ender, you might have seen him walking Yank, his American pit bull terrier, in Victoria Park in Hackney. It's Guy Fawkes night a year ago. Lloyd was watching television. Outside, there was a fireworks party, a noisy one. This film might prick someone's conscience. In fact, Lloyd's father is so anxious and determined to have the killers caught that he's decided to relive what happened with an actor playing the part of his son. Lloyd, can you get them sex for me? Colour in there and white in there. I'm a waste paper dealer. I collect waste paper, cardboard, and I do transport. So Lloyd worked for me. Just got to make a quick phone call. Lloyd was with me uh, Friday afternoon, and um, I um, asked him if he'd take the car home on the night time. So he said, yeah, OK, I will. Tell all that. See you later. When I arrived at the pub, he was sitting at the bar, drinking his little half of a pint, as he always has, and his cigar. But he never seemed worried, never seemed anything like that. He seemed happy enough. <laughs> On the Saturday, what he'd done, he brought the car back, then, the, then he's locked the car up, and then he's took the dog and gone his usual way. That's gone over the flyover, right, into Victoria Park and gone down towards home. Very easy. Easy, boy, easy. Long way to go yet, mate. Come on. Yank. Come on. Yank, back boy. Get your legs. Nice. Yes. Go on. Who's that? Go on. Go on. See if you can get him. Go on. Go on. You can do better than that. Go on. Yang is a, is, a, is a wonderful dog. Uh, he's an American pit bull terrier. They're a nice, friendly dog, providing you keep them away from other dogs. They seem to want to fight other dogs. All right, mate. No, I can't stop. I'll see you later on, all right? They are valuable dogs. I would say they're, they're, they're five, six hundred pounds. They're supposed to be brought into this country for uh, fighting. But uh, I don't know of any what do fight, and I know the Yankees never fight because Yanks only eleven. He was only eleven months old. Now, as he goes down the canal, this is where he's met Chrissy Roberts before he's gone home, and that's all I can tell you about that part. Of it. All right, mate. Yeah, Hello, Chris. All right, Yank. Yeah, he's doing all right. Yeah, he looks good. Like a new harness. Yeah, lovely. Where you get that? Well, I bought it today, just down the road. Yeah? Yeah. Handsome. I'll tell you what, I've got his old one indoors. You can have that if you want. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'll drop it off a bit later on. Lovely. Fine, where you been? I'll just drop the motor off down the old man's. Yeah? Yeah. As it goes, I'd better get him home, get him some dinner, like. Yeah, look right? hungry. I'll right. see you later, good all right? Time. Good luck, mate. Chrissy was the last one to see him alive. That was about half one. Then he went home. Whether he went straight home, that I wouldn't know. Come on, you. Up. Come on, you. Give it time. Give it time, boy. Didn't you? Huh? You enjoyed that, didn't you? Yeah, that's a good boy. Good boy. Yeah. 
Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. As far as we know, he laid there from the, from the Saturday to the Sunday and from the Sunday to the Monday. Because it wasn't until I went in the flat and I found him. I went through the door and then I shouted out, Lloyd, Lloyd, where are you? Lloyd. And then I got no reply. You know, when you think that the walls are so thin, and our people don't hear anything with a, like a shotgun going off. It's hard to believe that no one couldn't hear anything. I can't accept that no one don't know about it because someone out there must know about this. And I know if someone do know, but they're as bad as them who killed him. Bill Peters, why was he killed? What was the motive? If I knew why Lloyd Simpson was killed, I'm convinced I would be very close to finding those responsible. Quite clearly, he was killed for something that he had in his possession. Um, I think it may be drugs or something like, like that, because his premises had been searched very thoroughly and in what appears to be a frenzied way. Uh, and those are responsible uh, probably find what they were looking for. But it must have been something very important for them to kill Lloyd Simpson for. He wasn't expecting anyone, was he? He certainly wasn't. Uh, all indications are that he was sitting watching television quite comfortably with his shoes off, watching Saturday afternoon television. So he hadn't made an appointment. I mean, could they have known that uh, he was going to be there? Might he have met them that afternoon? I don't think so. Uh, they could see him from the veranda by looking straight through the kitchen window. They could see him sitting there, clearly through the, the beaded curtain, and uh, the, they then kicked the door in, went in and shot him. Now, apart from the neighbour, no one saw him, no one heard him. That seems to be the case. Unless, of course, people were, were frightened to tell you about it. Yes, this may well be so. Uh, if anyone is too frightened to come forward and to, to give me their, their name and address, they can do so, obviously, anonymously, in our incomplete confidentiality. And, of course, they can talk to a civilian if they're too frightened to talk to, to a police officer. So the motive is really the key thing. You need to find out why he died, and then you'll know who killed him. Yes, that would be a big step forward. Quite clearly, those responsible were very calculating. They chose the night very carefully. Uh, because of the fireworks going off at the time, and they were, they were thoroughly ruthless. And I would just like to add my words to those of his father and say that if any of you know why Lloyd Simpson was killed, whatever he had in his possession, uh, please contact us as soon as possible. All right, Bill Peters, thanks very much. You can call us here at Crime Watch on 01 811 8055, or you can ring the City Road Police direct at City Road on 488 5271. That's four double eight. Particularly disturbing because it's believed it could have been racially motivated. Just over six weeks ago, Mrs. Shamira Kassam and her three children died when a fire was deliberately started at their home in Chadwell Heath, Essex. Mrs. Kassam was expecting a fourth child, which would have been due this month. 
The police reconstruction here shows how the house in Oakwood Gardens was probably entered by someone climbing through the kitchen window. Once inside, four or five pints of petrol were poured in the hallway and set alight. Whoever it was left by the back door. It happened at five to four in the morning on the 13th of July. That's late Friday night, early Saturday. Just minutes before the fire started, a car was seen speeding away from the house in Green Lane, just around the corner. It's thought to have been an orange Toyota automatic, like this one, made in the mid-70s. The car has not been traced. As neighbours and passers-by tried desperately to rescue the family, a red Vauxhall Cavalier with an A registration stopped opposite the house. There were four or five men inside, and none of them made any attempt to help. One man got out and stood watching the fire. He was later seen at the front of the house holding a brick. This is a new Crime Watch video fit of that man. He's about 35, 5 foot 10, well built with mousy brown hair, a moustache, and he may have been wearing glasses with metal frames. There had been two previous arson attacks on that same house. One was in December 1982 when another Asian family was living there, and one on the 16th of June this year. That was just a month before that fatal fire. Detective Chief Superintendent Don Gibson is leading the inquiry. Mr Gibson, a really tragic, appalling crime. Yes, quite horrific. In fact, the police officers who were first on the scene were appalled by what they saw. Was this, in your view, a racist attack? It's a frightening possibility that it may have been racially motivated, but there's no evidence to show that it was. It's a terrible attack. There's no getting away from that. But there's no evidence to show that it was racially motivated. So therefore, we are looking at this aspect along with six other lines of inquiry. But that was the second attack on this house in, in less than a month. And, increase, and there are increasing numbers of racial attacks in your particular area. What, what protection are you giving to Asian families in your area now? Well, I think it's right to say at the beginning that um, there are a lot of attacks taking place on Asian families. Whether they're racial or not is, is a matter that's got to be decided on later on. But in response to the, the second attack, which occurred on the 16th of June, special units of the SPG have been drafted in, dog handlers, DSU, quite a lot of police officers put in there purely and simply to try and reassure the people who live in that area. Now, for people watching tonight, how might they be able to help you with this crime? Well, first of all, we want the person who was driving the Toyota to come forward and be identified. He might be able to give us quite invaluable information. Then there's the driver and the four people who were with, with, with the, the driver in the A registration Cavalier. We feel that they could also give us some useful information. And perhaps we could have one more look at the video fit of that <coughs> man. Yes, as you can see, he's about 30 to 35 years of age, 5 foot 10. He's uh, got mousy brown hair, <coughs> quite smartly dressed. And, and I think we must bear in mind that it's about 4 o'clock in the morning, so he may have been to a nightclub or something along those lines. But most particularly of all, we would like to speak to anyone who's got any connection or any knowledge of the Kassam family. And of that, I, I mean not just Mr. Mc, uh, Kassam and his wife, but also Mr. Kassam's brother, who was in the house, very badly injured, and is still in hospital. We'll let you get to the phones, Mr. Gibson. Thank you very much. The number to ring is Chadwell Heath Police Station on 01597 0025. And that number is also, incidentally, given on these posters, which police are now distributing around the central London and Essex area. Or you can ring us here in the studio on 01 811 Sergeant Desmond Michael is one of the officers working with Chief Superintendent Gibson on the case. He speaks Hindi. And there are BBC researchers here too who speak Gujarati, Punjabi and Hindi. They are all now waiting to take your call. A man who's killed once and might kill again. His victim was a girl of 19 and detectives are appealing to you to watch this reconstruction very carefully to see if you can help. Think back to just before the new year, Sunday the 29th of December. It's the first Sunday after Christmas. The place? East London. Beside the canal at Hackney is an area of workshops and print works, largely silent for the Christmas holiday. That Sunday, December the 29th, the roads here were deserted. But one printer's Fairway Graphics had deadlines to meet, and because of problems with machinery, Paul Tidyman, an assistant printer, had been asked to stay behind to do some overtime. Oh, Alison. Yeah, look, it's me. Uh, look, I'm going to have to work late tonight. Is that all right? Yeah? Do you want to come over here? Well, you better tell me how to get there, then. Although Alison had been Paul's girlfriend for three years, and they'd been engaged yeah. for two, 
she'd never been to where he works. Cross one road and you'll see fairway graphics on the, other, on the right hand side. All right? Now walk through the gate and I'll be there. What time shall I leave? Well, if you leave between about 5.30 and 6 o'clock, then I'll start looking out for you from around 7. All right, see you later then. Bye. Thanks, Mum. I'd better go now, because I don't want to keep Paul waiting. Well, you haven't had your sweet yet. Oh, I won't have time for sweet. Anyway, I don't want to get fat like you, do I, Dad? No, <laughs> oh, I do not. Mum, could I borrow a couple of quid for my fare, please? Yes, of course you can. That should be it. Fine. Thanks a lot. All right, I'll, I'll see you later. OK. Yeah, bye. 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 With only enough money for her one-way fare, her sheepskin coat and Paul's directions, Alison set off. It was a bitterly cold evening. Alison walked 300 yards to the bus stop outside Upminster Bridge tube station. A passerby remembers seeing someone like Alison standing there, waiting, at around a quarter to six. The bus she took would have been a single-decker 244 or 248 to Romford Station. The journey would have taken about ten minutes. From Romford, she took a 20-minute train journey to here, Stratford, in East London. It was at Stratford Station that detectives had the last clear report of Alison being seen alive by the ticket collector, Rose Lee. Excuse me, I think I've got myself lost. I've just come from Rock and I want it to Hackney Wick. Well, uh, why well, you got to go straight back down to the bottom, into your left, over the bridge number one. Number one? It's been freezing, isn't it? Yeah, he's really tough. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Alison may have waited 15 minutes on platform one for the train to Hackney Wick. This is the North London Link Line, just after seven o'clock, and Alison might have been the only passenger. The journey lasted just two minutes. Hackney Wick is the first stop. Police believe Alison arrived here at about 10 past seven. Though she may not have realised it, she was now just five minutes walk away from Paul in fairway graphics. But she never got there. From dozens of possibilities, detectives are now concentrating on three main theories about what happened in the hour before she died. Theory one is that Alison was followed from the train. Alison may have been lost, or she may have realised she was being followed. A minicab company remembers receiving a call from a young woman at 13 minutes past seven. Hello, I'd like a cab, please. I'm at Hackney Wick Station, and I want to go to Hackney. A delay? How long of a delay? Either her time ran out, or she couldn't wait. The line went dead. The cab telephonist remembers that the caller sounded distressed. Detective's second theory is that after Alison got off at Hackney Wick, she was lost. Having made the call and failed to get a cab, she walked 50 yards to the junction with Berkshire Road. If she'd walked straight on, she'd have got to Fairway Graphics in two minutes. Instead, she may have turned right and continued down Wallace Road. It leads to the canal and to a printer's yard where people go looking for discarded proofs of girly magazines. It could have been she met her killer here. The third theory is that after making the phone call, Alison again walked to the junction with Berkshire Road, but this time she walked the right way, straight down the road towards Fairway Graphics.
When she got there, she would have seen the sign saying Atlas Works, which she knew was another name for fairway graphics. But instead of going to the main doors, maybe she turned down to the side. It leads to the canal. Alison Day's body was found 300 yards away from Atlas Works in Hackney Canal. She'd been sexually assaulted and strangled. Leading the hunt for her killer is Superintendent Eric Brown. Perhaps we should stress straight away, those are three prominent theories. They're just best guesses, but there are other possibilities. Yes, there are. Um, Alison could have uh, been picked up by a car, someone purporting to be a minicab, or she could have used the S2 bus. Now, a lot of it is guesswork because the last definite sighting is Rose Lee, the ticket collector at Stratford. What do you know about the time from about 7 or 7.10, whenever it was, 7.10, 7.20, that she arrived at Hackney Wick? Well, she, uh, she got off the train at, uh, at the, the telephone box. She made that telephone call and uh, eventually her body was found in the canal at ten past eight. How do you know she uh, went into the canal at ten past eight? Because her watch stopped at about ten past eight and it's been examined forensically. And uh, we can say that it, it did stop immediately, it went into the water, and other forensic examinations confirm that. So she got off the train at 7.10 or 7.20 and was in the canal by 10 past 8. Yes. Now, what might people around there, if there were people around there, other than the killer, have heard or seen? They might have heard uh, Alison scream, or they might have heard a splash as this coat was put into the canal separately from Alison. Um, or they might have seen uh, someone on the Trowbridge estate, which is the estate close to the scene, carrying a coat like this. And this was put into the canal very close to the Eastway Bridge. Right. And you brought some shoes. These her shoes recovered from the canal? Yes, that's... Uh, no, they're not. Um, her shoes, these are very like her shoes. Her shoes are missing. And we would be very interested to hear from anyone who's seen a pair of shoes like this discarded somewhere. Have other women been attacked in this area? Yes, um, women have been attacked in this area. We'd be very interested to hear from any women that have been attacked in Hackney Wick or, or Leighton or Bow, which are very close. Now, the crucial time, presumably, is anybody who has been attacked or anybody who's been frightened by a man in that area, what, around Christmas time this year? This attack, remember, was the last Sunday of the year, the Sunday after Christmas. Yes, that's right. That's the crucial time. But we'd also be interested to hear from women who've been attacked in, say, the last three or four years in that area. Really? As far back as what? 1980, 81, 82? Yes, that's right. OK. Well, if they will ring, please do. Uh, if you can help, do ring us now. Here's the number, 01811 8055. You can, if you want, ask to speak to a woman police officer. If you prefer, you can ask to speak to a BBC researcher. It is in absolute confidence. Or you can ring the police direct on 01488 and ask for the Alison Day incident room. That's 01488 Five two one two. Operation Stranger. Police officially linked the murders of two children, six-year-old Barry Lewis and 14-year-old Jason Swift. We showed a reconstruction of the Barry Lewis case four months ago. Tonight, we concentrate on Jason Swift. His body was found only six miles away from Barry's at Stapleford Tawney in Essex. Both boys had been drugged. Very little is known about what Jason did or where he went during the last six months of his life. Some of the people who did see him during that time have taken part in our film to reenact what they remember. We're starting in Hackney in North London, where Jason was living with his sister, Hayley, last July. The flat where Jason stayed with his sister is boarded up now. The family has moved. Jason was brought up in Nuneaton and in East London with his three brothers and sister. When he was six, he was taken into care at a Dr Bernardo's home in Kent and lived there for four years. During that time, Jason got to know the south coast of England well. The children were often taken there on day trips. He went back to live with his mother in 1981, but left there in June last year to stay with his sister Hayley and her husband Adam at their flat in Hackney. Going down the market, Jason, do you want to come? No, I think I'll stay here. Are you sure? Yeah. You know, I'm really happy here. What are you going to be doing while I've gone? I'll just play Monopoly for a while. OK, then. See you later. Right. Bye. Bye.
Before he left, Jason stole 75 pounds in cash from his sister's bedroom. He took with him his clothes, a few books, and his Monopoly set packed in plastic carrier bags. The door was sort of open, but we thought like, nothing of it. We thought he might have gone into the shops or something and just forgot to shut the door. About 15 minutes later, we noticed the money had gone. And then we noticed all the insides, the monopoly had gone, all the boards and all the money and that had gone. That's when we realised he'd run away. That was on the 6th of July last year. The investigation into Jason's murder spans the six months up to the discovery of his body in November. Around the end of June or beginning of July, he visited a coin dealer in Charing Cross. Jason liked to collect foreign coins and had often called before, but this time he'd come to sell. Morning, Jason. Morning, if you got to buy these. Place them on the train. A group like this, I would pay about five pounds for. That's great. Okay. He was a very bright lad, uh, always very polite, very single-minded about his collecting. I suspected really that he almost fantasised about going to the countries that the coins originated from and having small change in his pocket to be able to spend if and when he arrived there. We don't know where Jason went immediately after he disappeared, but three days later, on the 9th of July, he turned up on his own at the Silver Sands Caravan Park in Camber Sands, Sussex. Uh, Mrs. Clark? Yes? The man on the gate sent me. Yeah? Can I stay in your van? How long for? Just two days. How many of you? Just me. Oh. Oh. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Come on. Van. Nice large van. So you're on your own then? Yeah. Don't you ever come out with your parents? No, they let me travel on my own. It's like an adventure. I'm uh, supposed to be visiting a friend in Hastings. Oh, well, that's all in the same area. You're not far from there, you know. No. I thought you would have had a friend with you to company to go about with. A friend? No, well. I had a friend stay with me once, and he stole money from me, so I don't trust anyone. He hadn't been here long when he came back with the key, and he said, I'm going for a swim. So he went for a swim, and when he came back, I suppose it could have been within the hour. I knew he'd been for a swim, because all his hair was all wet. <laughs> and uh, then he went in, in, but I think he might have been down for fish and chips. The next day, he uh, went for a walk to Rye, he said he was going to Rye. I uh, didn't see much of him that day at all. I couldn't make out really how old he was. I thought, you know, 12, because he had two front teeth missing and he seemed such a young child. Very quiet, reserved in his way, I thought. Didn't seem to... Um, well, he wasn't a pushy boy. I rather took to him, really. <laughs> Jason made contact with his family twice at the end of July. On the 22nd of July, he sent a postcard to his mother. The card, now marked by various forensic tests, had been posted on the south coast. Dear Mum, I'm OK and not to worry. I'm working with the fair at South End, so don't worry. See you soon. I'm going to the north soon. Jason Swift. In fact, police now know Jason wasn't with the fair at South End. Around the same time, Haley's husband, Adam, received a phone call. Hello? Uh, hello, Adam. Where are you? I'm staying with a friend from school and his father. Jason, where are you ringing from? I'm in South uh, London. What's the number? I'm, I'm not saying. You coming up? Yeah, I'm thinking of coming back. I don't know when. I'll, I'll find someone at night and tell you. Right then. Bye. Thank you then, bye. Nothing was heard or seen of Jason at all during August. Then, on the 11th of September, his mother received a birthday card from him. 
It was probably posted in either Croydon or Crawley. Dear Mum, I haven't forgot you, so don't worry about me. I'm all right. I'll come and see you in the next few months. Happy birthday from Jason. Again, the trail goes cold for the rest of September and the whole of October. Then, on the 6th of November, a girl who knew Jason thinks she saw him on a 253 bus in North London. She travelled from Manor House, but can't remember where Jason got on. When she got off at Mare Street, Hackney, Jason was still on the bus. About three weeks after that, Jason was murdered. He'd been drugged with tranquilizers and asphyxiated. Well, Detective Chief Inspector Derek Cass, there's one very important element in this case which we haven't so far mentioned, isn't there? Yes, there is. He had very few friends of his own age, but he did associate with gay men. Uh, and we're appealing in particular for these persons in the relevant period to come forward and contact us. Are there any particular kinds of people you're appealing to in, the, in that connection? Yes, with the gay connection in mind, um, I would ask the viewers this question. Did a boy of Jason's description visit next door or a house or flat nearby in the months that we are looking to fill? especially the last three weeks in November. If he did, and perhaps he wasn't seen after the last week in November, then I would ask him to come forward, or these people, the viewers, to come forward and contact us. Right. Now, there are a lot of gaps in that <coughs> calendar of ours. Do you think there are any other people who may have seen him, for example, maybe shopkeepers? Yes, that's right. Uh, Jason is a normal 14-year-old. He would visit shops to purchase sweets, crisps, drinks, uh, and uh, he often did this, uh, and shopkeepers, persons visiting shops, would probably have seen him. In addition to that, Jason had uh, a bedwetting problem. He also had mouth ulcers, and he had his two front teeth missing. Uh, and in connection with that, he may have visited dentists or doctors anywhere uh, to seek consultation. Uh, and we're again asking for the, those professions and their receptionist to contact us and come forward. Right. Obviously, as you said, the last month of his life is very important to find out what he did. Do you think he could perhaps have gone back to the South Coast, which he knew well and loved? Jason had a habit of either going to places he knew or to visit persons he knew. And it's quite likely that he could have visited uh, the South Coast or, for that matter, anywhere. Now, you've linked Jason's death with the murder of Barry Lewis. What are your reasons for doing that? There are several common factors between the two deaths. Firstly, they're both male boys. Secondly, they were both found naked. They were both positioned, uh, Jason at Stapleford Tawney and Barry six miles away at Waltham Abbey, both in rural Essex, both within uh, the borders of North and East London. Right. I'll just make clear again that any gay person who thinks they knew Jason during that time, between July and November, can come forward in the knowledge that it's in complete confidence and also that no action will be taken against them. Absolutely. Right. So if you do think you can help in any way, please do ring us. Our number here at Crime Watch is 01 811 Your calls will be treated in complete confidence. Or if you don't want to speak to the police, you can talk to a BBC researcher. Or ring the police direct at Essex headquarters on 0245 267 267. That's 0245 for Chelmsford, 267 267. A religious teacher, Abdur Rashid, was murdered in London's East End. The killing shocked the Bangladeshi community where he lived, and police and local people are hoping Crime Watch viewers may be able to help find whoever killed him. Witnesses and friends in Whitechapel have helped us reconstruct what is known about the last day of his life. But our film begins 12 miles away from where he lived, in Essex. It's lunchtime on Wednesday the 27th of April. A group of children were following a nature trail on the edge of Epping Forest. What's that? It was the body of 46-year-old Abdur Rashid. It had been wrapped in a bedspread, tied with a sash cord and set alight. For the Muslims, the burning of the body is the ultimate disgrace. 
Abdul lived in the Whitechapel district of London's East End. It contains a tightly knit Bangladeshi community which is centered around the East London Mosque. Some parts of Whitechapel are being redeveloped and sash cord used to tie the body may have been taken from a local building site. Abdur had been killed by a sharp instrument. Evidence suggests that a traditional kitchen knife, such as this dar, might have been the murder weapon. Abdur was well known in the area as a religious teacher. He came to this country in 1979 and worked part-time in the mosque. But in 1983, he left. After that, Abdur tried to make a living by teaching the Quran in people's homes. Police know that he had several arguments over debts. He was also selling saris and trinkets to women throughout the Tower Hamlets area, sometimes when their husbands weren't at home. Police say this may have caused some resentment. He was sending money regularly back to his family in Bangladesh. On at least one occasion, a contact of his in Birmingham took it for him. Maybe somebody there knows something about his death. Ramadan is the holiest month. It began in mid-April this year. It's the evening of Tuesday the 26th of April. At about 9 p.m., Abdur asked the family he lived with if he could make a phone call. Telephone engage. The family remembers Abdur looking through a blue book, possibly for a number. That book has not been found. When he finally got through, the end of his conversation was overheard. Abdur left the house at about 9.30. At 10 o'clock, he usually attended the mosque for prayers. But strangely, no one seems to have seen him there that night. At about 11, Abdur visited a friend in Rumford Street. He seemed nervous. Soon afterwards, he left. At about 11.30, another witness, Abdul Noor, saw him going down a staircase in a different block in Romford Street, block number 25. At about the same time, round the corner in Fordham Street, he was seen outside the Sillette Cash and Carry. <laughs> Who was he waiting for that night, and why? Some time later, Abdul Rashid was murdered. His killers may have bought some petrol in a can, but where? His body was driven north up the A11. They probably took the Epping New Road towards the M25. In the early hours of the morning, someone may have noticed a car approaching the Robin Hood roundabout. It would have turned left towards High Beach, which is a popular area for courting couples. It would have pulled in a few hundred yards along Fairmead Road. Abdur's body was dumped just inside the wood. The flames must have been visible to any passing car. Well, Detective Superintendent Jeff Parrott is leading the inquiry into Abdur's death. Can you tell me a little bit more about what sort of man Abdur was? Yes, upon his arrival in the country, Abdur took employment at the East London Mosque. And whilst that um, employment was terminated in 1983, he was still known in the community as the holy man. As such, he was very, very respected 
and throughout this inquiry everyone has referred to him as a good man. And with that in mind, it's a complete mystery as why anyone should wish to kill him. Mm. What you really need most to know now is where Abdul went and what happened to him after that last sighting outside the Cash and Carry. Yes, he obviously met someone outside the Cash and Carry. And from that point onwards, until his body was subsequently discovered, we have no sightings whatsoever. whatsoever. What about the car park at High Beach, near where his body was found? Yes, that is f um, used um, every evening by courting couples, in particular, often into the early hours of the morning. It may well be, and it's distinctly possible, that couples were still parked there at the time Abdul's body was dumped and uh, set fire to. It may well give rise to some embarrassment to people there, but I would urge them to come forward and give us what information they have. And I can only seek to emphasise that we will treat their information in the strictest confidence. Right, you guarantee that. And you're quite sure that if somebody was there, they could well have seen something? I'm sure they would. This burst of flame would be so obvious. Now, you haven't yet found the blue book that he looked that telephone number up in that night. Where do you think that might be? We haven't found that book. There's little doubt that that book contains um, the telephone number of the killer of Abdul Rashid. So that's a it, vital clue. It is a vital clue that. indeed, yes. And the other clue is that the body was wrapped up in a bedspread and, we, and we've had an artist draw up a detail from that. Where do you think that might come from? We haven't traced the origin of that bedspread. It's cream um, with a green uh, pattern and little doubt about that, that it, once we trace the origin of that bedspread, it will take us directly back to the killers of Abdul, Abdul Rashid again. So please do ring us if you recognise that bedspread. Now, thank you very much, Mr Parrott, for the moment. Um, Abdul Rashid's friends and associates are anxious, of course, to do everything they can to find his killers. And Abdul's 14-year-old son, Haruna Rashid, and one of the elders from the East London Mosque would like to make their own appeal in Bangladeshi. <laughs> এখন পর্যন্ত পুলিশে কোনো কিছু বাইর করতে পারে নাই আমার বাবার হত্যা সম্পর্কে কেউ কোন যদি তথ্য পাইয়া থাকেন তাহলে আপনারা দয়া প্রকাশে পুলিশকে অবগত করুন এটা আমরা কমিটি থেকে সবে অনুরোধ করা যায় যে আপনারা আগুই আর এই পুলিশের হুকা এতে কোনো লড়াই বার বা বয়ের কোনো কারণ নাই well, if you can help, please ring us. Here in the studio, waiting to take your call, as well as the detective here, we have a Bangladeshi speaker and a local community officer. The number, as always, to ring is 01811 Or you can ring Edmonton Police Station Direct on 01803 That's 01803 Next reconstruction tonight is a burglary which turned into murder. 39-year-old Derek Johnson was a happily married family man, devoted to his wife and 12-year-old son, and devoted, too, to the thriving import and export business he'd built up with a partner over the past 17 years. On the evening of Tuesday the 6th of November, just after returning from a week's holiday in Spain with his family, Derek Johnson was found dead in his office in East London. Police have helped us make the film you're about to see, piecing together what is known of the last day of Derek's life. The reconstruction takes place at Derek's office in Canning Town in East London. This is Canning Town flyover. Just nearby on Lanrick Road is Leapfield Maritime Limited, where Derek Johnson worked as financial director. Derek was quite a workaholic and often stayed late at the office. Hello? Hello, Mark. It's Dad. How are you? Oh, I'm OK. But it's due, Dad, tonight. But whenever he did work late, he would always so ring home to say goodnight to his young son. Down there, should you? No, I suppose not, Dad. Ah, OK, then. Look, uh, I've got to go now. I'm working late tonight, so I'll see you tomorrow, OK? OK, Dad. See ya. Yeah, OK. Now, night. About three weeks before Derek's death, one night in mid-October, there'd been an odd incident. Who are you? What are you doing here? I've come to pick up the cleaners. Well, you're not here. Go on, get out.
After that, Derek had arranged for all the locks of the office block to be changed. Yeah, it's now Tuesday, the 6th of November, the day Derek died. It was a hectic day with a backlog of work to catch up on after his holiday. As soon as I can, okay? Fine. Yeah, I'm not my eyes. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stay late tonight. Never mind, I thought you probably would. But don't forget to ring Mark later to say goodnight. When do I ever forget me? Yeah. As usual, the cleaners arrived at about half past five. Oh, by the way, uh, Steve popped in today. We uh, named the address of his new restaurant. Oh, great, that's the one he was telling us about. Yeah. Ah, let's get booked in. A colleague, Christian Muto, popped in to say goodnight as he passed Derek's office. I left the office at a couple of minutes past six at the absolute latest and noticed a couple of boys standing over the road just by world-class imports. Um, as I got across the road, looked out of the corner of my eye, they'd turned and were starting to follow. When I got up to the corner of Landwick Road, again looked back, they were following me. When I walked on down to the next kink, I looked back, they'd vanished. Whether they'd gone up onto the flyover or whether they'd gone back to world-class imports, which was still open, uh, or whether they just walked back to the flats or onto the industrial estate, I don't know. All right. Are you in tomorrow? Yeah, I'll see you in the morning. Yeah, all right. Okay. Hi, Brian. Hi, Jen. All right. Good Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Don't worry, I'm going to be in for a while yet. So. Okay. Come on, man. Hi. World-class imports is directly opposite Derek's company. But that night, it was about 20 past six, and... We've been staying behind simply because we were waiting for our driver to turn up. He'd gone to do the delivery down in South End. I was looking up and down outside the windows from the showroom. I noticed there was a dark blue or a black car pull over, and it slowed right down outside our window, and I thought, well, I hope that's not a late customer. I carried on looking to see where this car had got to. A couple of minutes later, I noticed it was coming back again, and uh, it did come up there twice. It was about 20 to 7, I actually got in my car and got to the end of the road, and as I got round to the corner, I realised that same car was there and it looked as if it was stationary and, and I was like ready to overtake it. As I did so, the car suddenly just like slowly pulled away from me, so I was behind it. Unfortunately, he didn't notice the registration number, but the car crossed Canning Town flyover heading towards Essex. <laughs> he got another one after that. <laughs> While they were there, the cleaners remember Derek received two phone calls. <laughs> At about 6.35, they heard him laughing and joking on the phone. Then, just five minutes later, the phone rang again. This time, the conversation was longer and more serious. The cleaners left the offices at about 10 to 7. Good night, Good night Derek. Good night. Derek was now the only person in the building. Concerned that Derek hadn't made the usual goodnight phone call to his son, Mrs. Johnson tried a number of times to contact him. By about 20 to midnight, extremely worried by now, she decided to drive the 10 miles to his office. Derek had been killed shortly after the cleaners left, between 7 o'clock and half past 7. Dave Easy, the intention was burglary, but do you think whoever did this intended to kill Derek Johnson? Mr Johnson had been tied with rope, his hands and his feet, and sellotape had been wrapped very firmly around his nose and mouth. He couldn't possibly breathe. Whoever did it knew that he would suffocate. Now you brought with you a piece of the rope that was used to tie Derek up. What is particular about this piece of rope? Well, as you can see, this is sash cord rope and it isn't manufactured in this country. The rope in length that was used to tie up Derek Johnson was 24 feet, and the ends of both pieces were sealed, as you can see at the end, with a burn. I need to know if anybody sold a rope of that length, sealed like that, and any date near the 6th of November. 
Let's move on to those two phone conversations. They're both quite short conversations overheard by the office cleaners. What might their significance be? There were two calls at 6.38 and 6.40 p.m. They were the last calls that Mr Johnson would have received. It's important for us to know who made those calls. Even if it's only to eliminate them from inquiries? That's correct. So if you haven't come forward, please do, do come forward and, and tell us that you were those people. There are some specific people that you now know about who you want to trace who were seen in that area on that evening. That's right. In particular, the op occupants of two motor vehicles. The first motor vehicle is a dark car which parked at the entrance to Leapfield Maritime at 6.48pm. There were two occupants, both male. The passenger got out of the vehicle and walked towards Leap time, Leapfield Maritime. The vehicle then drove off after about 10 minutes without this passenger. Some 15 minutes after this, he was seen running away from Leapfield Maritime towards Canningtown flyover. The second vehicle is a Ford vehicle. At about 7.20pm, it parked again at the entrance to Leapfield Maritime with two male occupants. After about two minutes, the driver and the passenger got out and changed places. After about five minutes, they also drove off towards Canningtown flyover. I'd need to, need to know who those men are, in particular who was the running man. And somebody may have seen them, or the running man, and I need them to contact us. All right, these are absolutely vital. Remember, we're talking about Tuesday the 6th of November, early evening, between 6.30 and 7.30. There are local people who have got together to offer a reward of £10,000. If you know anything at all, this is the number to ring, please, if you can help at all. The smallest detail might make all the difference. 081 811 8181 here in the studio, or you can ring the North Woolwich Police Station direct on 0708 729 602. That's 0708 729 602. Tonight, an unsolved murder, at least unsolved till now. The victim, Larry Burt from Ramsgate in Kent, was so well liked, according to a friend, will probably have to have St Paul's Cathedral for the funeral. Won't be a minute. Janet, can you come and have a look at this? The dropout's far too high in this relay. Right, you reckon it's that one? Yeah, it's right. Larry Burt worked as a quality assurance controller. Part of his job was to test products before they were sent out to clients. What could I do with that? Uh, shouldn't that stay here? Thank you. <laughs> Open your eyes. Can you hear me? Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's unconscious. What do we do now? Mouth's mouth. You're jumping the gun. We've got to check for breathing first. Larry was a branch officer of the Red Cross and twice a year led courses in first aid. I run the Red Cross here in Margate. Um, I very often help Larry with his lectures. He was full of fun, he was loved by his students and many of them have stayed friends over the years. Now, clearly there's nothing happening in this poor chap. <laughs> so, only then do you follow the ventilation procedures. Right, change the subject. I need a casualty. Who fancies being tied up? Jean? Oh, dear. <laughs> Need a hand? Larry. Oh, Larry. How are you doing? You just got back then. Yeah. What's this then? Uh, Slimming again? It's only for the week. My engine blew up. We've known Larry now oh. for about 25 years. He lost his parents during the war in an air raid. And um, now, of course, his adopted parents are also dead. So he was totally alone. He had no relatives at all. And he just adopted practically everybody, his friends, as relatives. And he had a heck of a lot of friends. Yes. In fact, yeah. I would say that the, the, his death has been a, a great personal tragedy to a great many people. We had an awful lot in common. He, he had a common interest in art, didn't he? Oh, yes, we had a common interest in art. Mm. Lots of things we, we were interested in and, and encouraged to be interested Most in fun. by Larry. 
Um, he introduced us to bird watching, basically. Yes, you know, he he had an he was enthusiastic about all sorts of things, and he managed to convey it to people. He had a zest for life, mm. without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, look, um, I won't see tomorrow, because I'll get up London have a mooch around. Uh, I'm going to take this on the train. Mm. So, I'm going to see you Sunday, though. Right. Okay, okay, fine. Bye. Right, bye. Yep. bye. On Saturday, the 26th of February, Larry boarded the 9.52 from Dumpton Park to London. Morning tickets, please. Oh, sorry, um, cheap day return to Victoria, please. £15.70. Thank you. It's not known where in London Larry meant to visit but he clearly intended to return that same day. Ticket. On in, tickets, please. 20 Thank minutes you. later, the same guard, Ian Williams, remembers seeing someone sitting opposite Larry. Although I didn't see them talking, it looked to me as if I'd interrupted something. I remember she had a five-day return yeah. London to Whitstable. Larry was just the sort of person who might have started up a conversation with a stranger. If that woman was you, and if he mentioned his plans for the day, it's obviously important. At any rate, please call us. Larry visited London every couple of months, but from here, it's all conjecture. He probably cycled from Victoria out towards the East End. In the past, he's talked of visiting St. Catherine's Dock, as another of his interests was boats and chandlery. Maybe you saw Larry cycling around Wapping that afternoon. In Wapping High Street stands the town of Ramsgate pub. Larry may have been there in the past. Did you see him here in February? Larry had binoculars for bird watching and was an accomplished photographer. He was also a remarkable artist and would often turn his drawings into cards for his friends. Perhaps you noticed Larry by the river that afternoon. With his sketch pad, camera and binoculars, he would have been distinctive. The next day, overlooking the river at the rear of a warehouse known as the Old Pump House in St. Catherine's Way in Wapping, Larry's body was discovered. It's likely he was murdered in this yard above the river, probably the day before. He'd been strangled. In fact, Dave, Inspector Michael, he was strangled with a scarf left at the scene, identical to this one. And, and it wasn't his scarf? No, it wasn't his scarf. Um, the person who strangled him would have been the owner of that scarf. The scarf was well worn so they've had it for some time and we'd like anybody who knows somebody who went out with a scarf similar to this who came home without it uh, to get in touch with us 26th of february saturday 26th of february possibly sunday the 27th of february the bike that now he had is, is missing i mean it's conceivable that whoever killed him came over the bike as well tell us about that yeah it's the metallic blue man's Abbey Racer Tora bicycle. It was modified since Larry had it, and it had uh, chrome mudguards, back pannier, and the handlebar tape was blue. 
Now, what are other things were taken? Because you suspect the motive is, is robbery and quite a lot of belongings disappeared. There's a good chance. We would really like anybody who knows about the other missing property, which includes a swallow binoculars, which is adjustable. The, like these? That's correct. A uh, these are 8 by 21s Yes. Also a 35 millimeter automatic compact camera with built-in zoom lens. His personal belongings in his wallet, identity cards, uh, a black rucksack with possibly sketching materials. Anybody who's had this property who knows anything about it, please get in touch with us. Now, in truth, knowing that the stuff was stolen, they might be quite reluctant to get in touch with you if it's passed through their hands. They don't want to be done for receiving stolen property. Okay. Obviously, that's quite understandable, but rarely we're just concerned with Larry's murder, and we would encourage these people to come forward Please get in touch with him. Now, since you don't know really where he went between Victoria Station and being found near St. Catherine's Dock, you need to find anybody who met him at all that day or perhaps any other day in London when he was on his... We know he had a good knowledge of WAP in the East End. Also, he had a broader knowledge of London. But anybody who was with him that weekend or knows anybody who was with Larry, please get in touch with us. Inspector, thank you. If you can help in any way with this case, the number here in the studio is 0500 600 600. Or you can run the incident room direct. That's on 071 488 5241. 071 488 5241. To protect people's identities. It's about an attack for which there's no known motive. It may have been a robbery which went wrong. Conceivably, the assailants may have intended to cause harm. Either way, it finished up as murder. Our reconstruction begins in September near East Ham in the capital. This is part of London's East End, where for centuries migrants have settled, the latest being largely Bengalis, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. Atek Hussein came here in 1978 and went straight into the restaurant trade. He married Panna 12 years ago, and they and their children got a maisonette in East Ham off Newham Way. Atek was devoutly religious and devoted to his family. His other interest was his restaurant, an hour or more's journey from his home. The cook, he say he can't start Monday. He owned it jointly with his brother, Malik. My brother and I start restaurant sure? business yes, no many problem. years ago. We bought a Wallingham Thandori eight, nine years ago. Uh, what about the shopping list? Have shopping, you um, get some green chili and cool the Atmosphere, the restaurant women are all friendly. Some of them call Atek, you know, Chacha, mean uncle. Some of them call him a bai, bai mean brothers. Yeah. Hello. It's been a very long time. I've been on holiday. You have just come back. You've got a nice tan coming up. <laughs> Let me get your menu for you. Thank you. Thank you. Mom. Have you brushed your teeth? Yes. And you washed your face? Yes. Okay, in we get. Snuggle up. Okay, good night. Good night Don't Mom. stay up talking now. Good night, night Mom. I'm going, okay? Good night. Good night, Malik. Bye. Are you two finished? Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. I'll just get changed and then we can go. After dropping off the two employees, Attic arrived home in Bernal's Avenue at about 2.30 a.m. be your father. He's got his keys. He wouldn't be ringing. Don't answer the door.
Something's not right, Dolly. Phone the police. Attic? Attic! Attic! What happened? Attic! Attic! Kilo Oscar 1 receiving Kilo Oscar. Go ahead, over. Could you go to Bernard Avenue E6? A male collapse, over. Yes, all received. Kilo Oscar 1 out. When I turned into Burnales Avenue, by the phone box where the first emergency call was made, I saw a pool of blood on the pavement. I then went to the house where the second call had been made and the door was closed. I attempted to open the door but it was, it, there was something behind it stopping me opening it. And it was then that I heard groaning and moaning from behind the door. A local resident noticed other people at the scene apart from the police. Oscar, confirm an ambulance has been called to Burnells Avenue E6, over. Excuse me, I don't know if it's got anything to do with what's going on here, but I've just seen a bloke hanging around on that corner. What, this side? Yeah, stay here, mate. Paramedics were there within five minutes of being called, but no one could have saved him. Attic had been stabbed through the heart. Tim Smells, as I said at the beginning, Attic had no known enemies, did he? No, that's right. He was a much-loved family man. Now, you've got a description of one of the guys who were running away. Two of them, and they were both Asian. You think, what else do you know about this chap? Yes, that's right. Uh, a witness saw two Asian men running away. Uh, we have a good photo fit uh, of one of them. What else do you know about him? He's uh, in his 20s. Anything more in description? As you can see, he's uh, medium height, medium build, with thick black hair, with a side parting, and uh, we believe he was wearing a dark bomber-style jacket. The white car that was seen at the end of the road, is that, do you think, significant, or are you looking for witnesses there? Are you looking to eliminate that? Yes, we certainly want to speak to the occupants of that car because uh, we believe it could be holding witnesses. It's a long time ago, this, September the 18th of, uh, sep Sunday 18th of September. Uh, people will have thought of that as a Saturday night, of course, late on a Saturday night four months ago. There was also the man who was seen on the corner there. Again, he's probably a witness, nothing to do with the, the attack. You need to trace him, though. Yes, that's right, but uh, unfortunately we haven't got a very good description other than uh, he was black, about five foot eight. But uh, again, we'll be treating him as, uh, at this stage as a witness. Now this uh, jacket, ordinary man's denim jacket with a very distinctive uh, logo, which is Portland College on the breast pocket, and it's got uh, this green lapel or collar in corduroy. Tell us how that was discovered and why yes, it's significant. That was found about a quarter of a mile away from the scene. Uh, in some uh, rough ground. Uh, we believed it was dumped there on the night because uh, the undergrowth was all wet and uh, that was dry. So we'd like to speak to anybody who knows this jacket, seen this jacket or uh, seen anybody who uh, owned this jacket and uh, hasn't been seen wearing it since the date of the incident. Which is the 18th of September. There's a £5,000 reward which has been put up by the Community Action Trust. So please call us if you can. It's quite likely that people in the Asian community who want to help have been unable to because of language barriers. So because of that, a Saleti speaker is here to take calls this evening. If you can help, please ring the studio 0500 600 600 or you can contact the incident room at Stratford in East London where they speak five languages incidentally as well as English. That's 0171 275 5411. Notice we're now using the new dialing codes with an extra one in the number 0171 275 5411. There is the worst crime you can get, but in our next case, someone not only murdered, but then trying to cover up the evidence, set fire to a flat in a block in which some 55 people were asleep.
This is St Mary's in Walthamstow, East London, and Joy Hewer went there every week. She retired early as a school teacher and devoted all her energies to church work. She helped run soup kitchens, do office work, and volunteered for cleaning. Hi Joy, how are you this morning? I'm exhausted. Joy would very simply have said that her life centred around Jesus. That was her life, and it was expressed by involvement in churches. When you arrive as a new vicar in a parish, uh, as I did uh, in July 94 here at St Mary's Walthamstow, um, some people uh, avoid you because they think you're busy settling in or they, they think the vicar's too important to come and call on. But one of the very first person to call on me was Joy Hewer. He said, I just want to welcome you to Walthamstow, and you and your family, and say how pleased we are that you've come. Uh, and she had a bunch of flowers to give us. She had a big grin all over her face and just said, it's so nice to have you. And uh, off she went. One of the churches that Joy attended on a regular basis over the last two or three years was the London Healing Mission in Notting Hill Gate in West London. It was an important part of her life and she went there every Tuesday and Thursday regularly. She attended meetings there, I believe, on those days and also helped out with some of the administration connected with the church. That evening, Tuesday, October the 17th, Joy got home about six o'clock. The couple living two floors beneath her were also home that evening. I'm back! Oh, your mum called. How long ago? Just now. Okay. Upstairs, Joy was staying in and was also on the phone. Hello, Steve. Oh, Tim. Is your dad there? When will he be back? Can you tell him I called? and ask him to give me a ring back. It's nothing terribly important, um, but I'll be in all night if he wants to give me a call. Lovely. Thanks. Bye. I remember that I had a bad stomach, so I went to bed around 10 o'clock. Um, my boyfriend went with me, and he fell asleep nearly straight away. About 10.30, I was woken by lots of banging noises, crashing furniture being thrown around or something. And I was a bit worried because the flat above was empty and I thought somebody might have broken in there. Carried on for at least five, ten minutes. After I went quiet, somebody started running downstairs really fast. Heavy feet. Must have been a heavy person. Sometime after 10.30, a motorist on Forest Road almost collided with a man sprinting from St David's Court. Did you see something too? Another motorist, a good Samaritan, may be a further crucial witness. Was this you? Hello, you know the junction, um, at, it's in E17, yeah? Walthamstow. St David's Court, a block of flats, is it a junction? Yeah. yeah. I was just driving past there and I saw like flames coming out one of the, one of the um, floors. I'm not sure what floor it is, but I just saw it and I thought, well, I'd better just... Uh, yeah, so when you say it's at the junction, what's it at the junction of? Hold on, let me ask someone. Excuse me, do you know the name of this street? Yeah, it's um... Yeah. Yeah, Walthamstow Town Hall is in the um... the junction of Wood Street. I think it's Forest Street. The Forest other Street, one. okay, we're on our way. Yeah? Okay then. Has, has that come up? Yeah, we're on our way now. Yeah, okay then. Alright, bye. 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 And who was the helpful man at the bus stop? Um, we had no idea if anyone was involved in the fire. There were obvious signs of smoke on the lobby, so we had to move quite fast. When Farman found Joy, she was already dead. She'd been stabbed. Can you imagine what it's like for my parents? I mean, my parents are both very elderly now. They're not too well. For, for parents to see a child die in any circumstance before they go is pretty catastrophic. But for it to happen in this way, it's just 
totally devastating. And they told me that, you know, what they dread is waking up each morning and just having to face it all over again because it just doesn't get any easier. It just goes on and on and on. John Arthur, the main suspect just has to be the man running out of the flats and David's court across the road. Yes, indeed. We are very anxious to trace the individual that ran across the road sometime after 10.30. Uh, he's quite distinctive. He's black. He's very thin, very tall. Six foot four, in fact, the witness has described him as. Um, he ran very fast from the steps of the flat into the road. In fact, a motorist had to take evasive action, otherwise there would have been an accident. Now, six foot four, that is very, very tall. Yes, Perhaps it is. fewer than one in 200 men are going to be that, that big. Obviously, when you're driving, you're looking up at somebody. Maybe he looked bigger than he really was, but he's certainly tall. He, he was thin. six foot four because the, the witness has been seen, and yes, I'm happy with that description. Now, there was another man you need to, not so much eliminate, but a potential witness who was there some hours earlier, three or four hours earlier. That's right. We've been fortunate. We've actually traced the majority of people that were at the flat on that day. However, at 6.35, a white man was seen at the flat by the lifts talking to a young couple that were bringing furniture into the flat. And he is described as being, he's white, he's 21, 24 years of age, five foot seven tall. He's well spoken with a southern accent and he has a boyish face. I don't believe he may be in, uh, involved in the, uh, in, the, in the investigation, but we need to eliminate him. Now, I've been to the flat. Joy had a, a, a spy hole. She could see people who were outside, and she was certainly dressed in her night attire when the, she answered the door. I mean, it must have been someone she knew, or presumably it was someone she knew she let in. Well, that's right, Nick. I, I am of the opinion that she knew the person that actually uh, came into the flat that night and actually killed her. She was a cautious person, we know that from our investigation. She would use the uh, stairs rather than the lifts. She would use the British Rail stations rather than underground when travelling to London. So in my opinion, she would not have allowed anybody into that flat unless she knew who that was. So you need was. to know everybody who knew Joy or who knew ever just any pieces of the jigsaw that you can bring together about her life and who she knew? That's absolutely right. At the moment is a motiveless crime. We need to hear from all people that, that knew her in order that we can ascertain a background and uh, there certainly she attended various churches one was the London Healing Mission and we would like to hear from uh, present members and past members uh, if they can help us with this investigation. John Arthur, thank you uh, very much indeed. 0800 600 600. Uh, if that's busy then you can try the instant room on 01 81 345 4351. That's 0181 Three four five four three five one. Really strong calls coming in tonight. We'll tell you about them later. In one of the first ever Crime Watch programmes, some I think it was 14 years ago, we covered a terrible crime in which a man posed as a gas board official and murdered a shopkeeper who'd let him into his kitchen. We now have what may be somewhat similar crime. This time, a man posing as a water company official. It happened in Bethnal Green in East London on a Friday afternoon four weeks ago. The victim was Mary Lazenby. Her family are all keen that this appeal should go ahead, but they're so distressed they couldn't themselves take part. So Mary's carer guides us through what happened. Her life was her cats. She loved her cats. I used to say to her, Mary, have your dinner. And she'd make sure the cat had a dinner first. Chico! Chico! I've been going to see Mary on and off for about 10 years and I used to take her dinner every day. Come on then. She mainly just stayed in her flat. She might put the telly on sometimes. But she was mainly with her cat. Deep down you do have your little favourites. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. You know, and Mary was one of them. Mary had her own flat at the end of this corridor in Rochester Court, housing for the elderly. It may be sheer coincidence, but her neighbour, Sophie, had an unexpected visitor on Friday afternoon, the 21st of May. He had no right to be in the building, and certainly no right to be inside Sophie's flat. Who are you? Hello there, I'm just from the water board here to see about your water. Do you have a bowl or anything like that I can borrow? There's nothing wrong with my water. Let me see your identity card. Yeah, of course, there you go. Okay. Tell you what, should we go and see the warden? She knows me, she'll vouch for me. Go doubt. Okay. Later on, Sophie found her purse was missing. 
Soon afterwards, two men were seen sitting on a wall in Wilmot Street outside Rochester Court. Who were they? And was this their van? Then, half an hour later, the son of some residents answered the intercom. Uh, sorry, I've uh, got the wrong flat. OK. Who was trying to get into the building around 5 p.m. that Friday? Was this you, innocently going to the wrong flat? Or was it the man who'd stolen Sophie's purse? Then, an hour later, at Mary's end of the corridor. Here we are, ladies. Come on, ladies. Mm -hmm. Off we come. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought we could... As we came out of the lift, we saw a man at Mary Lazenby's door. Come on, Mary, are you all right? Are we going to try that dress on all? I assumed he was visiting. He was very casual, and he just walked in and out of sight. I've got a lump in my throat. Every time I talk about it, I feel sick. You know? Because she... She would have let anybody in. She would have believed anything anybody would have told her. But to do what they did to her is just unbelievable. Half an hour later, Mary was heard talking to someone in her flat. What are you doing that to me for? Even then, I just thought it was a relative or a visitor of some kind that she knew. She wasn't shouting, she didn't sound frightened. And we can go down. As we went in the lift, I heard Mary's front door open and close quite quickly. Now I think that maybe it was her opening the front door and maybe him shutting it. Maybe she was trying to get out. And I wish I'd gone back up to have a listen outside the door or even from the lift, I might have heard something. OK, dear, I'm all done. I'll see you next week, all right? You take care. All right. When I left my clients, I was walking towards Mary's door. A young fella came out of the door. You were going in this flat? Oh, no. He didn't appear nervous at all. He was 17 to 18 years old, medium height, had short blonde hair, a thin face with a chipped tooth, and was smart and clean. Mary's body was discovered in her living room the next morning. She'd been punched and kicked so hard that her jaw, her ribs and her spine were broken. I just remember the lady I used to go to every single day for years. Warm, lovely, simple lady. And I just, I'll just remember smiling, to, smiling at me at the door. Make whoever killed her seems to have completely lost it, lost control. Yeah, Mary's injuries were absolutely horrendous. Her jaw, her sternum, every rib in her body was broken. Her spine was actually snapped and her heart and her liver both exploded as a result of the force used on her. She was a, a small, frail lady with a disability. She I mean, was, yes. It seems inconceivable that whoever did this could have, could have done this as a first offence. I wouldn't have thought so. I would have thought there was probably a string of minor offences that have led up to this. Uh, did he do this on his own, or do you think there were two people involved, or perhaps more? There was certainly... He was in on the flat, in the flat on his own. I would think that there was a possibility that there was another man outside the flat somewhere, maybe in the street outside, or outside the confines of the flat itself. How seriously in trouble is that accomplice? Well, I can't believe that two people went out that day intent on committing this horrendous crime. I would think that probably one of them doesn't know what his accomplice has done. If he was outside and he went out with a view of committing what he thought was a minor crime, a theft of some description, and now he knows what's actually happened within, if he comes forward and speaks to us, tells us who the other person is, I can assure him I will deal with him for the minor offence of theft providing he's got nothing to do with this offence of murder at all. And if he doesn't come forward, is he in much bigger trouble? Of course he is, yeah, because that just shows that he may have some sort of knowledge, or he may have been part of it. Now, this effort of the... we've got from the witness who saw the man coming out of the flat, you're fairly confident of that. Tell, tell us what you know about this man's description. The effort is very good. The man is about 18 years old, he's 5 foot 10, he's got an angular face, pointed features, quite slim build, 
He's described as quite good looking with short cropped hair, but there's, he's got half a tooth missing on the left hand upper part of his mouth and his smile is actually ruins his good looks apparently because there's a buckle in the rest of his teeth. Now, this is terrifying to, to people, this sort of attack, particularly to elderly people. You were telling me earlier, uh, older people shouldn't be worried about this sort of thing. It's very, very rare indeed. It, it is very rare, Nick, yeah. Older people shouldn't be worried at all because statistics show that younger people are more prone to be victims of violent attacks. And as I said before, there's absolutely no need for this sort of violence to be used on this type of person. Well, this is a horrible crime. Though. There, there may be something, anything that you can contribute. If there is, please, 0500 600 600, that call costs you nothing. Or you can ring detectives in the incident room on 0171 790 one two. That's oh one seven one seven nine zero one two one two. Wade Hewitt was an unusual character, but harmless and kind. Hi, Lager. Oh, mate. I haven't seen you before. You knew, yeah? I come in all the time, mate. I tell you, all the time. Wade would speak to anyone, including himself sometimes. On a Thursday night five months ago, he went on a lone pub crawl around Plasto. He lived in something of a dream world and fantasised that he was responsible for half the crime in the East End. Remember that? That was me, that was. Seriously, straight up. Honestly. The rogue. Uh, the fun-loving rogue. I couldn't believe anything he said, really. Come round here once on Mother's Day or something to get... And he's got a bunch of flowers with all the earth still sticking underneath it. We took it out of someone's garden. <laughs> Just that, uh, you know, crazy. Wade lived in Dagenham with his girlfriend Zara and their daughter Paige, and he was heading back there from the Green Gate. To get home from Barking Road, he'd take the number five. It was now approaching midnight. Right. Uh, Wade used to have a drink, and... Um, when he had a drink, he used to, he used to talk to right. people, talk to people whether they had a drink or not. That was Wade. Yeah, can I try that on? Go on. Now, the crucial part of this appeal. Do you ever take the number five up Barking Road? Could you have been travelling late on Thursday night last November? Oh, I'll find something. I'll have something, mate. You may have noticed Wade. He was mumbling to himself. I mean... You might well recall if you got on at Barking Station that a woman and two young men barged in at the front of the queue. Two seventies. I don't know. That's too much for me to think about. I don't want to think about it now. So many people, man. What's going on? I was getting to I got a clue. <laughs> That's the taste one again or something. I don't know. I can't be bothered with all this. I don't need the people. Shut up. That's all I, got. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Say Shut nothing. up, man. Oh, I'll get Wade was stabbed several times. Do you remember that succession of bells to stop the bus on Longbridge Road between Thurlston Avenue and Meadway? From Meadway they went down to Brixham Gardens, probably not where they live, and then the trail goes cold. We was in that hospital for 30 hours while I was on a life support machine. You know, we kept seeing his eyes flicker. And we thought, oh, he's going to come round or something, but he just uh, never did. I, we think it was probably the life support machine that was, you know, showing signs of life. But really, we, he was, uh, we was told really he was, he was been sort of dead for hours. Were you embarking on the Thursday before bonfire night? Maybe you came from the station or one of the shops or pubs. Did you travel home on the number five bus? Remember the three who barred to the front of the queue? Maybe you'd noticed them earlier that night. He idolised Paige and she idolises him and he, he just loved her to bits. She just doesn't know where her dad's gone. And it's hard trying to tell her, like, Daddy's gone to heaven. She's going to be without her father. 
for the rest of our life. Michael, when we put together these reconstructions on crime, which some victims of the crimes can see appear slightly more sympathetic than others. Now, Wade didn't have an unblemished past, but he certainly didn't deserve this, did he? He certainly didn't, Fiona. Um, it's an unprovoked and callous attack on a defenceless and harmless young man, ostensibly just making his way home after a night out at the pub. He did. As you see, it seemed completely unprovoked. What can you tell us about, about the three people who were on the bus? The young people uh, involved, they're all black. Um, the two young men, um, they were about between 16 and 18 years of age, medium height and build, and uh, casually dressed. The, uh, the young girl was also casually dressed. She was about 14 or 15, uh, maybe, a schoolgirl, and we're particularly keen to speak to her. Why her? Why are you so keen to get hold of her? Well, if I was able to speak to her now, what I'd be saying to her, to her is this. Look, you're probably scared out of your wits. You're probably very, very frightened. You've probably been expecting a, a knock on the door from the police for about five months now. You may even have been threatened not to, t to come to the police and uh, tell us what's happened. What remains clear to us is that it wasn't you that stabbed Wade. And I think the right thing for you to do is to come forward, seek police help and protection, and tell us what happened. Because if you don't, uh, and try and cover up this crime, then there could be serious consequences yeah. for you. She could get in a whole load of trouble. Obviously, it's so much better if she knows anything. It, well, she obviously knows something, but if she could actually come forward and, and help you. Now, there were other witnesses on the bus, weren't there? Still people you want to hear from? Yeah, we know that there are about 35 people that used the bus that night between uh, the Greengate pub and Longbridge Road. We've traced 17 of them. Uh, obviously, there's a number still outstanding, and. Uh, those that were on the bus when the crime happened couldn't have helped but know that it had happened because the police and ambulance came and they were ushered away on another bus. Okay, well, let's see what we can do tonight. If you're that girl, uh, give us a call. If you know that girl, give us a call. You know anyone who was on that bus, if you're a witness on that bus, give us a call. Let's see if we can solve this. The last stabbing on a bus we covered was solved by Crime Watch viewers. Help us with this one too. And there's a £5,000 Crime Stoppers reward. Call us here in the studio or 020 7275 4336.